Here at the San Diego Air and Space Museum, we try to cover all aspects of flight. And one of my favorite parts is lighter than air. Uh, for a, the first 50 years of the 1900s, airships, I wouldn't say they ruled the skies, but they did rule our imagination. From the, the war zeppelins from World War I to the giant leviathans flying around in the 1930s, um, it wasn't just the people on the ground, but it was the media. Everyone was fascinated with these giant airships. Some of these got truly gigantic. This is a wartime Zeppelin. This is, a, this is an early one. L-31 was a, a Captain Matthews' machine. He was a very famous commander in the First World War when Germany was using these to more or less just terrorize England. They didn't have the military capacity to do very much damage. There were one or two successful raids, but by and large, when they sent these airships over England, it was kind of a coin toss if they were gonna come back or not. So, our airship display starts with L-31, famous uh, Captain Matthews machine. He was shot down in this machine. So, these things were extremely dangerous for the crews as much as they were for the people on the ground. And World War I showed people the bad things that airships could do. The period after World War I showed people all the things, all the good things that an airship could do. So we're going to go around the corner into the 1930s. So here in the golden age of flight, we start off that gallery with an airship display. We start with a height climber. This is a model of an uh, end of the war German airship. This was a specialized machine designed to be very light and capable of flying over the top of all of England's defenses. It did a fairly good job of that, but again, these things didn't have any safety built into them and they lost quite a few. At the end of the war, Germany decided Viking funeral time and all of their remaining fleet, uh, there weren't very many left, were burned down at their mooring sites. So once World War I ended, pretty much uh, all that was left was the smaller blimps in the other countries of the world, but Germany's fleet of airships was gone. In the immediate post-war era, they realized they didn't want to let it go, and they, they started building them back up again, in, including this fabulous airship called the Bodense. Look that one up. It's, it's what I consider the, the high water mark of airships. So that led into a period of rapid growth and expansion for the lighter than air industry. And primarily it took on two forms. Although other nations did have them, Germany created a small fleet of passenger airships uh, for the 1930s and the U.S. Navy built a small fleet of very large airships to serve as aerial spotting posts. These are supposed to replace the light cruisers of the day. Instead of having a crew of several hundred, you'd have a crew of 60 or 70 performing the same duties as a light cruiser, out scouting ahead of the fleet. Uh, now that idea didn't work out in practice. Each time that the large American airships were used in a fleet problem, by the end of the exercise, they'd been destroyed. Uh, it didn't take the various militaries around the world long to grasp the lesson that airships were beautiful. They were not in any way uh, instruments of war that could compete with aircraft of the day. Because by the 1930s, by the time the Hindenburg and the, uh, the other large airships were built, by that time, aircraft had proven that they could cross the Atlantic. Uh, in 1927, when Lindbergh crossed, basically that should have told the people in the airship industry right then that airliners were coming and they were gonna be able to cross the Atlantic much faster and at better altitudes so they'd be more efficient. Um, so this is a, what most people would consider an engineering dead end. Uh, of course, all of us have seen the giant uh, explosion video of the Hindenburg going up in flames. Well, at that time, uh, there had already been a couple other airship disasters. Nothing too terrible, but uh, other than uh, a significant loss to their crews. But the, the public of the day was already starting to see the airships. They, they had memories, and they still remembered World War I. These things brought death and destruction. As late as 1932 or 33, 
when these German airships came on passenger flights to England, there were still reports of mothers throwing their kids on the ground and covering them with their bodies when these airships passed over, because people still saw them as instruments of terror, even when they were just bringing passengers over from across the pond. So by World War II, the, the sun had already set on airships, as, as they were back then. That era was coming to a close in Germany as they were gearing up for World War II. The big airships of the day, the, the second Graf Zeppelin and a couple of their smaller airships that they had built, they were disassembled, they were deflated. Their hydrogen was used for other purposes and the materials used to build the airships was melted down and turned into bombers and fighters for the coming war. So that really wrapped up the German side of airships, at least until uh, well after World War II. They, there has been a renaissance. There's never been a, a time when the people in Germany have given up on the idea and uh, airships continue to be built there. I've been really blessed with a friend taking me to a couple of the museums devoted to airships in Germany. So this is not just something that we celebrate at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. This part of history was to a lot of people it was very glamorous and it's it's something that we remember it probably as being a little bit more glamorous than it really was and today all that we have left is a case of models so here's a little side note to our airship display Periodically, I'll find something in my travels, and I realize it's something that we don't have at the museum. This is a case of that. The hat that you see in front of you is an actual World War I airship commander's hat. Uh, not very many of them. They probably made a total of 150. The only other people in the German military that had a similar hat, but with a different band inside, was the minesweeper captains. So when you see this particular hat, there's only a few people that wore that one. It was offered for sale on eBay as a, quote, Nazi submarine commander's hat. So anybody that was a collector of World War II German memorabilia would instantly see that this is not World War II. So those collectors decided they didn't want it. People who collected submarine mem memorabilia looked at that and said, that's not a U-boat captain's hat. So all the usual people who would bid on this did not. Uh, the opening bid, I believe, was $107. And for $107, I purchased this hat for the museum. So we got it, turned it over, supporting documentation. It is an airship commander's hat. So eBay giveth, and sometimes it taketh away. This time, eBay giveth.